Hey, welcome back to the Car Doctor Studios and Facilities here in Anchorage, Alaska. My name's Tim. I appreciate you stopping by and being with us today. Thank you, Steve Robb, for turning up your volume and actually listening this time. Uh, I think you might get more out of it than just eye candy. I'm here to, uh, you know, entertain you in more ways than one. So thanks, Steve, for tuning in and turning up the volume. So anyway, we got this here Mercury Mountaineer or Ford Explorer based vehicle that today, it's a 4.6 actually motor. And uh, we're gonna do brakes all the way around, pads and rotors. I'm gonna do an oil change. I'm gonna replace a leaky oil filter adapter gasket, throw a serpentine belt and replace the front differential pinion seal. This is the four wheel drive version of course. And that's what we're going to do here today. And I, once again, appreciate you coming along and watching it all happen. Uh, otherwise, I'd be lonely here. Um, tried to get Steve Robb to actually come be here. I offered him free plane fare uh, and accommodations and free Canadian beer. And I've yet to been able to entice him to come up, but uh, you know, maybe he's not good at reading lips. So maybe by having him turn on the volume, he'll get this message. Steve, come on up, buddy. I'm gonna take you fishing and hunting, and uh, I need some help at the shop or someone just to keep me company. The winters are cold and dark and lonely up here, and uh, you know, sometimes you just need to cuddle. So anyway, let's get busy on this. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the wheels and get rocking. Once you remove the caliber mounting uh, bolts uh, on the sliders, and also I've kind of stuck a screwdriver in here and kind of depressed the pistons a little bit, but I'll still have to use a C-clamp and compress it the rest of the way once I remove it, but always use a, something to support the caliper so it's not dangling by the brake hose. That'll damage the brake hose. That won't be good. Just going to support it up here out of the way so I can service the rest of the brakes. Now I'm going to remove the two caliper bracket bolts to the steering knuckle so I can remove the caliper mounting bracket as well as the rotor. These are 18 millimeter, by the way. I'm just going to use an impact and remove those. Remove the bracket. Now my rotor is loose. Remove the rotor. You know, there's a little bit of uh, out of parallel in the brake rotors, which basically means that uh, between the hub surface, which should be rotating around uh, in a flat fashion, the, the rotor is bleh, 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 which equates to a pulsating brake pedal steering wheel kind of shaking a little bit and uh, you know decreased braking uh, performance so that's why we're replacing the rotors that the actual surface isn't too bad um, and you can see there's not a lot of corrosion so uh, in Alaska we just we're super lucky that way we don't have a lot of corrosion problems at least for the most part and uh, but I'm replacing them uh, simply for the fact I could machine them on the brake lathe, but for cost uh, and and the fact that uh, as you get thinner, and if I machine off enough to take up the out of parallelism, I'm also reducing the thickness of the rotor probably by enough 
that it's going to be more prone to warping because it, it can't dissipate heat as rapidly and, and just not having as much substance, it's going to be prone to warping again. And I don't want to see them back here. I want to get them to get another 100,000 miles out of these things. Probably not 100,000. In this case, maybe, maybe 60,000. Uh, with just how braking, uh, you know, and road conditions are up here, it it could be different in your area. You might get, or your type of driving, you might get, might get a lot more miles than this guy did. But uh, you know, I followed some of my customers around and seen them riding their brakes for for 20 miles down the road, and um, you know, uh, you go through brakes quicker that way, and you tend to warp rotors more. Well, somebody was asking about my toolbox, and I've resisted doing a toolbox tour just for the simple fact that uh, it's kind of embarrassing. Some of the tools I have in here and I've, I've put up with over the years, I mean, there's the kind of sockets I have. Nah, just kidding, but sometimes I use, you know, whatever I can get by with just to get by. I don't have everything in here. I'm using a lot of my wobbly sockets right now, but this is my socket drawer. And this is an old, older snap-on box. It's about 20 years old and it doesn't have any of these door locks. So unless this is locked, these doors can just come open. So if you're ever pushing it around in the shop, um, this can be uh, a little dangerous because um, the doors tend to pop open and all your tools fall out. Here's some screwdrivers. Man, I like the snap-on screwdrivers. Uh, I like these ones with the hard plastic handles. Um, they're getting a little harder to find, but these are my favorite. They don't, when you get hydraulic fluid on them and stuff, they don't deteriorate. Some of the newer handles that kind of have a more grippy surface, uh, if you get certain uh, oils on here, they tend to deteriorate and get kind of messy. But uh, here's some old stuff. This we used to. These are carburetor adjusting tools. These were for the old Rochester Quadrajets and Duo Jet two and four barrel carburetors that we always had in the shop. We were doing the emissions testing up here and it was a typical problematic carburetor that required servicing to get the carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon levels in check. Here's, you know, I, I mean, this is why I was reluctant to show my toolbox. It's just kind of a mess. I'm not always the most organized person. Here's my snap-on uh, super duper turbo air chisel. Here's a nice Ingersoll drill. Here's an angle drill. And I've got a couple of these, uh, what are they, 2131 D and D Ingersoll Rand impacts, the very best. Some angle die grinders, and uh, this one's pretty decent. This is a snap-on uh, high-speed die grinder, and uh, this thing's held up well. Even this piece of junk, you know, it's a fifty-dollar tool that lasts forever. And these IR uh, XP, or it's actually a one hundred nine XPA is my choice of 3 8 air ratchet and you've got the hammer head which is a cool tool it actually impacts you can even remove uh remove flywheels with that thing when you have just not very much space here's my kind of miscellaneous hammers and plumbing tools even every master tech should have one of these you know, they work pretty good at pulling seals and stuff. It's amazing uh, what a claw hammer will do. Here's some pullers and slide hammers and 
axle bearing uh, sat. I've got some three quarter inch dry. That's an old Craftsman set of three quarter stuff. Here's a, a coil spring compressor. There's some old school coils. Um, got some stuff down here. I don't even know what's in here. There's an this big pop rivet. Uh, I don't go down here much. It, I have to bend over too much to go there. Some stuff in here. Stuff. I don't even know what it is. Uh, you know, uh, video inspection device, a couple uh, torque wrenches, nice snap on torque wrenches, power steering pullers, a couple. Uh, brake line flaring hits some wrenches i've got the snap-on combo wrenches i've got the uh, snap-on ratcheting combo wrenches metric and standard some oddball wrenches some various extensions and wonder how many people keep similar toolboxes this seems uh, the way I've got things set up just seems uh, it seems like it's uh, the way it should be but that's just me other people do it completely different um, you know stuff it's again you get up here and and it's this is miscellaneous things and stuff and This stuff. I, I don't. I don't go in here much. I, there's there's some stuff up there, but uh, I don't go in there too much. Some uh, drivers there. Some different various size drivers. Fuel fuel line. Toothpaste. You gotta have toothpaste. Some stuff. Oh, that's, you know, I've got a lot of other equipment. I've got my strut compressors and front end tools and stuff scattered around up there. Got a lot of hardware in the shop. Some stock over here. Keep is you know some oil and filters and different kinds of have you ever i mean if you want to to carry if if i wanted to carry every kind of oil and coolant and fluid that's required for most uh common auto uh you know foreign and domestic vehicles i would this it would take up the whole f shop I almost said a bad word but uh there's so much stuff, so I just try to keep what's most common. Here's a project for a later date. It's been on the stand for a while. 460 Ford, big block power. I'm going to, with a 572, I'm gonna punch it out all the way and stroke it and go with that. I got a press, just kind of a cheesy press. I've got you know, tire balancer and tire changer, a stock of aluminum and steel type wheel weights. Here's what I do with my used wheel weights. They go from this and they go to that. And these are what we use to go fishing. This ain't for bass fishing, boys and girls. No, sir. So, here's where I store some of my cats. You've probably even seen some videos where these cats were removed. And I'm saving them right now for when the price of those semi-precious metals goes up. Right now, I'm not really, locally, I don't have a good source for getting rid of those cats. So, I'm just going to hold on to them for now and uh, you know, beer money for down the road. 
Here's my alignment machine. It's the two camera John Beam visual liner. This aligner system. Keep it under a barbecue cover. So that's about it. I got a nice workbench here. Um, put some plate steel on. A uh, little took it to a break and had a nice uh, bend on the back and it lapped over the front. And I got the bench at Costco for like, you know, it was, it was like 150 bucks. And uh, uh, actually a friend of mine helped bend the, the metal. And I, I hate to tell you what I paid for that. It was zero. Threw a vise on the end of it, which works out well. So I got a, uh, Amco brake lathe for turning drums and rotors, but I tell you what, it, I, I don't use it very much anymore. Um, like with this rig, you know, the cost of replacement rotors versus labor to turn them and uh, the cost benefit after that's done, said and done, I just go usually with new ones, unless there's some other issue I'm trying to address. Keep some waste oil here. Got the, the drain that uses air pressure so I can pump into these barrels. And then a friend of mine has an oil burning furnace. I just have gas furnaces, but a friend of mine uses it. So got a parts washer there. Got a uh, Miller 250 wire feed welder and I've got the spool gun so I can do aluminum with that. I just need to switch tanks and just a run of the mill oxyacetylene. Oxyacetylene is great um, but again I'm not in the rust belt so guys in the rust belt are using this oxyacetylene deal I think every day. I'd be lucky to crank mine up once a month just to get a bolt loose or something like that. But, well, anyway, that's, I think that about covered what I meant to cover. I'm gonna, on another video, I'm gonna show these rolling jacks, which are part of this alignment machine. And I'm gonna cover the, the use of these, but there, of course, when you drive on this rack with the car, Position those under the axles and lift the vehicle off of the rack and allow for servicing the, uh, you know, suspension and wheels and brakes and whatnot. So, pretty cool deal. Well, that's the Car Doctor Studios. So, uh, I do keep it clean and fairly organized. I don't have every tool uh, that Eric O has. And uh, I take a little bit of pride in just getting by with, with less because you can spend a fortune on tools and equipment. And sometimes if you just use a little bit of uh, you know, brain power and backwoods engineering, you can find some things out that uh, that all the tools and equipment in the world won't help you do. Not that there's anything wrong with having all the right tools for the job. Sometimes it's embarrassing to, to actually call yourself a technician and then fight through some of these things where if you spent 150 bucks on a tool that, you know, you'd take five minutes instead of five hours like it takes me. But I'm a glutton for punishment. So, anyway. That's the Car Doctor Studios. Let's get back to this job. I gotta get busy here, make money to buy more tools. So uh, I'm gonna throw some rotors on the rotors. Uh, today I'm going with the wherever brake rotor. That's actually for the rear. Putting quality pads and rotors on. It's 
important. They come with a coating on them uh, to prevent rust and whatnot. It's a good idea to use some brake clean and get that coating off before you drive away. Which there's two schools of thought on the coatings. You could also probably just drive it and it'll burn off. But I've had customers go take it, come down the hill after doing a fresh brake job. I didn't clean off the oil and they pulled up to a stoplight and smoke billowing out. They were sure there was a problem. And they called me in a panic, panic mode. Okay, most premium brake pads are going to come with hardware. Well, you can order these with or without hardware. I always get the hardware because I want to do a complete job. don't want them coming back. Complaining of squealing noise. So, I never discard that hardware. Always replace it. I mean, these things, even though they're stainless, they do get a buildup of rust on them. And that's going to translate to, to noise, eventually. So, um, go ahead and replace that. You got to be careful with these, get them on there all the way. Especially right down in here, where that has to go up inside there. And you, get, you want it fully inserted and back away, because otherwise the rotor contacts there and makes terrible noise. And then, uh, like to service these sliding pins. This one's really dry. You can see it's really dried up. And uh, there's supplied lube, but I just like the color of purple, so I put this ceramic brake lube, is what I use. Don't get too much around this rubber part on this pin because it then it it creates a hydraulic effect and you can't depress that pin all the way in but I, I keep them uh, oriented the way the way they came out don't get those mixed up uh, get my boots back on correctly and uh, So, in this case, there's no inner or outer pad. They're both exactly the same. You want to look closely at that. There's no wear indicators on these pads. Um, so, no special orientation and no wear indicators I need to install. And we're just, you know, Stick them in there. Ah. It's hard to do. It's usually easier to do this before you put them on the car, too. Ah. Not that it's easy this time. Don't bend your hardware. Mm. You have to cut and go to commercial here. Frustrating. Ah, yes. Outer pad. Goodness. Tight fit. There we go. Okay. Now, last thing I'm going to do before I put the caliper mounting bracket on is put a little uh, blue Loctite on the caliper mounting bracket bolts. 
then I'll lightly install them with the impact, but we need to torque this properly as well. Because even with an impact, it just doesn't ensure that you're going to get them torqued properly. So the bracket to knuckle torque is 83 foot-pounds. And then the uh, caliper to bracket bolts are 23 foot-pounds. And this is an O2 Mercury Mountaineer. Your actual torque specifications may be different. I suggest always that you consult your repair manual for proper procedures and specifications. Car Doctor Studios cannot be responsible for improper repairs or lack of uh, common sense used when uh, conducting your repairs. Uh, improperly repaired brakes can create safety issues which could lead to a car accident or even death. Be careful out there and uh, use some common sense. That's what the manual is for, and usually a, re a decent repair manual nowadays is uh, fairly inexpensive to get for your vehicle. So if you want to do DIY repairs and save some money, it's worth investing 20 bucks in a, a manual of some sort. So now I'm gonna compress the brake caliper. It's a dual piston caliper, and whenever compressing a caliper, you want to do so uh, evenly so that you don't bind the, the pistons. Eey. And you don't want to drop Whoa! don't want to drop your camera or your torque wrench while doing so. Oh boy. Okay. Uh oh. Bye bye. This YouTube, YouTube makes fixing cars really hard if you're making videos about fixing cars. So, anyway, I'm just going to take one of the old brake pads and my caliper and just kind of lay it up there, insert one of the old pads in there and use my C-clamp, open it up so I can get right in the middle and compress it without binding any of the pistons. If you get it to where one piston is compressing and the other isn't, then you're going to not, it's not going to be good. So. Sucking in nicely. Okay, we've got her fully compressed. We're ready for reinstallation. Want to make sure that your brake line is not twisted. If you have a little pretzel, um, that's not good, and you don't want that. Pretzels are bad in this case. They're good at the shopping mall, but bad on your brake caliper. Again, I'm going to take some blue Loctite and add a little bit to the caliper uh, bolts to the bracket. And like I said, in this case, the spec was about 23 foot-pounds. That seems like a lot. But get that on there, right? Hmm, not cooperating. And 
torque it to 23 foot pounds. <laughs> click, click, click. All right, just double check my work. And again, I'm gonna clean this off front and back with brake clean. You can do that before you even put the rotor on. Uh, and then make sure all my ABS wirings run properly, not gonna rub against something. And we'll move on to the other side. And then I'll, I think we'll revisit this on the rear and uh, I'll go through one of the rears with you, but I think you get the idea here. And uh, <laughs> and then we'll wrap this puppy up. Okay, let's move to the rear and see what we got back here. These are actually a little bit easier. They are disc brake systems, but you won't be required to remove a mounting bracket. Try to compress the caliper a little bit. Oh yeah, got it completely compressed. This one takes a 10 millimeter. Here's another thing uh, you may run into the brake rotors if they're never been removed may have the factory speed nuts on them these aren't necessary to replace basically for assembling the vehicle keeping the rotor on so you got to remove those and tap on the face of the rotor a few times. Be careful not to hit the wheel studs. So, uh, also something you want to inspect while you're in here on any of these rear brakes. There's a parking brake. Uh, there's shoes on the back. So you want to check the condition of the brake shoes and clean this area off a little bit um, while you're in there. In this case, the uh, shoes look good. They've got life left in them. So I'll move on to the hardware. So on this application, there's some hardware back here, which I'm popping off. And just replace these little stainless shoes with the supplied new ones. Again, most of your premium brake parts are gonna include the hardware. Um, if there's an option, I suggest getting those equipped uh, that come with the hardware just a good idea and it's gonna it's gonna keep you from making noise going down the road and all that due to rust build up on old hardware Let's see okay well, also at this time um, you can uh, you can choose to service the caliper um, by replacing these boots, which the sliding pins uh, go on, or you can put a little bit of lube in there uh, to ease in the operation of the sliding pins. Uh, it's good to check those and either service or replace those as necessary. And I'm going to go ahead and install the replacement rotor. Okay, so these pads are going to be an inner and outer pad. 
These are both the inner pads, but you can see the difference here, um, depending on if it's the right or left side. So just by comparing the inner pad that came off of the car, I can tell that this is the match for the inner pad on this side. The little hook uh, orients towards that side. So I'm pushing the inner pad on. Now the outer pad matches that. So I'm installing that on the caliper as well. I'm making sure my little pins seat properly into the caliper. And there's no gap and it's fully seated on there. So when installing these, you'll want to put the notch side in first and engage that into the upper portion of the bracket, like so. Like so. So once again, I'm gonna put, apply a small amount of blue Loctite to the caliper mounting bolts. I'm gonna install those and torque them properly. So once I get that done, we will move on to the oil filter adapter, which we're gonna service and change the oil and serpentine belt. But this thing's going along pretty smooth. That's actually a pretty quick job. And uh, all these things, pretty common repairs. You know, don't forget to check your brake hoses and brake lines while you're in there. If you're in an area where you're subject to corrosion, check your brake lines for rust all along the frame rail. And also check your brake hoses, the rubber hoses, the flexible hoses that come off the frame, the steel line, and then lead over to the caliper. You wanna make sure those don't have any cracks at all in them. And uh, if they do, that you're servicing those as well at the same time. You don't want sudden brake failure. You don't need your brakes uh, when you're just, you know, driving around. You don't really need them until you really need them. When, uh, you know, a moose jumps out in front of you on the highway, you want to be able to slam on those brakes and have them work as they're designed. So don't forget that part. Okay, we are torquing these to 100 foot-pounds, the wheel torque. All right, something I should remind you of, every time you do a brake job, like this, where you've compressed the caliper pistons. Uh, after you're done, you want to lower it down and pump the brake pedal before you go throwing it in reverse and backing out of your driveway, because if you do that, your pedal is just going to fall to the floor and you're not going to stop. Uh, a couple things to think of, you know, probably at this point, definitely a higher mileage rig. Uh, brake fluid, it sucks in. Uh, water from the atmosphere. It's a hydroscopic fluid. So uh, as that happens, the boiling point actually comes down to where you could have braking fade or braking system failure under high heat condition, a, a high temperature condition where your, your uh, braking system is experiencing high heat and the fluid begins to boil and then uh, that creates air in a spongy or, or falling brake pedal as a result. So it also, when you're compressing a caliper piston, you're for forcing all that fluid that sits behind it back up in the system. Well, if there's normal uh, wear stuff from the caliper seals and, and the sludge that kind of builds up behind the piston, by compressing that caliper, you're forcing that back up into the system, which uh, could be problematic. So it's recommended that uh, while you do these services, uh, actually compressing the pistons, you should open up the bleeder screw, compress the piston, and then when you're done, thoroughly flush and bleed the system. However, it's uh, notable to mention that the uh, 
this has an ABS system that's rather difficult to bleed short of using a scan tool in the recommended bleeding procedure. So that said, uh, you may as a DIY guy uh, forego any bleeding and as long as you don't open the system while you're compressing the caliper pistons, that won't necessarily be uh, necessary. That won't necessarily be necessary. Uh, but uh, definitely don't forget to pump the brake pedal when you're done and then remove the uh, master cylinder reservoir cap and you know fix a little boot in there that's made to kind of expand out as fluid drops down and now the fluid levels come back up and you pump the pedal it's good to uh, uh, double check your reservoir fluid level uh, first you want to clean the area you can use some brake clean on that before you remove the cap so dirt doesn't get in there and then uh, make sure that the reservoir cap and the little gasket underneath it are properly sealed. But again, all things to consider and uh, safety is definitely the first and utmost thing to consider in any brake system service. Okay, now we're going to move on to replacing the oil filter adapter gasket. Common oil leakage point on this vehicle, uh, the, the 4.0s, uh, even the V8s and the 4.6 here, uh, can leak around the oil filter adapter, which is basically the, the part that bolts to the engine block face and then has a little angle and then you screw your oil filter onto the end of that. And basically you'll see the leakage here uh, emanating from below the oil filter location as a telltale sign, uh, which in some cases this, this uh, leakage here could be from this, the oil filter being loose, which there is a slightly loose oil filter and, and leaking from the gasket there. But then if you come around to this side, well, that's going to be really hard to see but um, you didn't have to take my word for it. Let's see how, see if I can get up in there. But anyway, you can tell it's leaking. It is leaking. Trust me on this one. Yeah, it's pretty hard to see. I'll show you the adapter once I get it removed. But uh, what I'm going to do first is drain the engine oil and remove the filter, which I'm gonna to have to do anyway to access the oil filter adapter gasket, um, which, which I have here. That's the adapter gasket. And you just drain the oil. Maybe. And I'll also remove the filter. It's kind of a tricky filter to get to. Yeah. It's not the best tool to use. Oh my goodness. There we go. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to remove this little plastic catch pan. Give me more room to access. Maybe I'm going to remove it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put the oil drain plug back in. pressure cinder wiring harness by just reaching up and pressing it. Hopefully. Maybe not. some coolant since the coolant runs through the oil filter adapter I actually have to remove the lower hose off of it off the adapter housing so I'm gonna drain the coolant into a bucket as best I can now I'm gonna lower the vehicle a bit actually I got to take the left front tire back off so I can get that connection of the lower hose to the adapter um, through the wheel well area. So create a little extra work for myself, not a big deal. Maybe I can get to it without pulling the wheel back off. Just pull back this little rubber pull back the rubber okay and I see I see the connection at the hose get my hose clamp pliers I can get that clamp loose. Oh boy. Okay, I'm about done waiting for this thing to drain. Kind of got impatient and I want to move along with this process. I did get the, the lower hose clamp off using my 
cable style hose clamp pliers um, and they work pretty good. I was able to stick it up from the bottom and come between the differential and over the top of that hose and remove the clamp and now I'm just going to push that hose back and hope that Niagara Falls doesn't flood the entire bay with coolant Ugh. but I'm not going to wait all day and it's probably going to spray everywhere anyway even if I drain the coolant the best I can oh boy it's going to get messy I'll catch as much as I can. Remember the car doctor uh, advocates safe and re environmentally responsible disposal and capture of uh, any type of uh, fluid out of your vehicle. Antifreeze uh, does not make for good Kool-Aid. And if you got pets, uh, animals, cats, dogs, children around the house, and you want to keep them around, uh-oh. It's best to safely remove um, antifreeze from the premises. So it looks like I've got three attaching bolts for the housing that attach it to the engine block face, which I'm going to remove now. using a 13 millimeter wobble socket. Okay. Oh, there we go, baby. Oh. Went right in the bucket. So now, see if I can Pop the housing off. Uh oh, it's a little tight. Maybe there's some more bolts. Am I missing one? Hmm. Let's see. Oh yeah, there's there's one more. Hmm. Where is it? It's right where I can't see. side. adapter there's where the oil filter screws on and sticks out down here there's where the upper hose goes on you can see the four attaching bolts where they go through the engine block so I'm going to clean up the ceiling surfaces take it over the solvent tank and then uh, clean up the block surfaces and replace this puppy 
Okay, go ahead and carefully position the gasket after I've got everything cleaned. And reinstall the unit. I've got one of the upper bolts in to keep my gasket semi in position here. So I'll start that. Try to start that. Oh my goodness. Now I just need to put a little bit of oil on the filter gasket so that it's lubed. You don't want it, to, it'll just stick on there if you don't. my filter a little bit. I'm going to clean my plastic catch pan before I put it back on. Just reinstall the catch system. which the catch pan is just a little plastic pan that's meant to catch the oil when you're servicing the oil filter so that it doesn't drain down in the, the cross member up front here and just drizzle out for a week after the oil change. <laughs> Okay, now I'm gonna just lower down a little bit, secure my cover, a little splash shield back over on the left inner fender well. And I've, I've kind of cleaned up the area here. And uh, we have to remember to go ahead and refill the cooling system before we ship this rig. But I'm gonna move on to the final repair before I lower it down. And uh, we're gonna do the front differential outer pinion seal it's at the rear of the front differential where the front drive shaft connects. It's that little seal there around the pinion shaft of the differential. And I'm uh, gonna replace that real quick and clean that, that area up. Okay, now we're gonna uh, tackle the front pinion seal replacement on this. And uh, something to be careful about, uh, there's a crush sleeve in the pinion uh, between the, the outer pinion bearing and the inner one along the pinion shaft. And when the outer pinion nut, well, it looks like my video cut out there, but I've already removed the pinion uh, yoke. Uh, 
uh, in the nut. The nut was an inch and an eighth, and I used the impact to remove it after disconnecting the drive shaft, of course. And now I'm going to pull the seal. And anyway, the point I was trying to make is that when you're torquing the outer pinion nut, there's a crush sleeve inside, and you want to go with a preload, uh, a bearing preload. Uh, so basically using an inch pound torque wrench to uh, adjust the preload and the tightness of that nut. If you over tighten it, you'll crush that crush sleeve and uh, usually you know, suck your pinion depth out wrong. And then that's gonna create premature failure of your uh, pinion gears, which you do not want. So there's a lot of feel involved uh, in just using an impact um, and then working the nut back, uh, the, the, the yoke back and forth which is a method I'm going to use. I don't advocate doing that, and you could blow up your whole front end if you do it, but um, I've had great success just going by feel, and I'm sure a lot of people will criticize that, but, uh, you know, really you can't get proper preload with the torque value with, with these wheels on and the rotors turning around and all that. You really need to disconnect the drive shafts uh, to get that value even close, and I can do a better job by feel. And that's just the way it is. And that's how it's going to go. So I'm going to pop the seal out. Ah. Hopefully, without hurting myself. and uh, get the replacement seal ready to install. Okay, so I've used uh, some emery paper. I've cleaned this up and uh, cleaned it off and applied a bit of grease. And we're just gonna reinstall it.
Here's the critical part for retorquing. You know what? Feels good. Let me go with that. I'm going to apply a little bit of blue Loctite to the U-joint strap securing bolts. Um, just a dab of blue Loctite. And stick those back in. Clean things off a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, refill. Definitely check and top off the front diff fluid level. And then, uh, like I said before, I'm gonna remember to uh, top off the cooling system and I'm gonna finish the oil change up top by filling, you know, topping off the oil and checking all the rest of the fluids. And then we're gonna have this thing wrapped up and uh, it went pretty good. So uh, just uh, maybe hopefully something in here that's helpful for somebody and uh, just a cool little quick job that uh, just about anyone can do. Skill level is around a six or so, you know, which procedure we're talking about. Definitely brakes are a common issue on these and about the time the rears are gone, the fronts are just about ready to. So something to think about and I do appreciate you stopping by the shop. I always appreciate you watching. I like it when you click the like, when you, when you click the thumbs down, uh, I don't like that. It keeps me up at night. I have to call Steve Robb and, and uh, it's hard uh, using sign language over the telephone. Um, so we, we don't want to have to do that. Um, uh, so let's keep it real. And thanks for subscribing too. Uh, appreciate all the support from all the awesome viewers of the Car Doctor channel. And I wish you good luck with your repairs. Hey, thanks for stopping by. Take care. Okay, we got the Fart Machine 2 with the extra base boom box. And uh, let's call the parts store and mess with them a little bit. Hello? Okay. Uh, star six seven. Hi, performance. Hi. Uh, hey. Uh, do you do you sell mufflers? I can get some mufflers. Uh, what, what is it for? Well, my wife said I need a muffler. Um, it's not really for my car. Um, what? You, you, she lately she's just she's been saying. Oh, excuse me. Um, 
She says I need a muffler. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, usually after I eat like burritos or something like that, uh, she says, you know, you need to quiet that, quiet that down. Do, do, do you have something like a universal fit that would help? Is this a joke? Uh, she says it's no joking matter. Um, she says I'm full of it. And, uh, well, I'm just wondering, it, something that would just kind of, it, it, you know, the sound, if it would just help with the sound, the, the, the stink we can deal with. There's air fresheners and, and whatnot for that. Okay, I have to go now. You have to what? Check the, hello? 